Steve, last December, you published an op-ed titled A Five-Point Plan to Save Harvard from Itself in the Boston Globe. You wrote that Harvard is now the place where using the wrong pronoun is a hanging offense, but calling for another Holocaust depends on context, and that deplorable speech should be refuted, not criminalized, but you also noted that outlawing hate speech would only result in students calling anything they didn't want to hear hate speech. Can you bring us up to date on the climate at Harvard? And you know, we'll go from Harvard to a larger academic setting, but how are things going there? Is you know, it seems as if free speech was embraced by the former president of Harvard uh, and by many people in the institution. But is it a real commitment to free speech and it, you know intellectual seriousness? Yeah. It, it, well, Harvard's a big place, and there is a, a diversity of, of opinion in uh, co-founding the Council on Academic Freedom at Harvard. We, there was a. A, a rush of faculty joining us, but still a small percentage of, of the faculty. Many of them vocal, many of them for the first time had an opportunity to just communicate with themselves across the sprawling uh, uh, multiple campuses at Harvard. Uh, many are, are uh, upset at the direction that Harvard and other elite universities have taken in um, <clears throat> uh, restricting the range of expressible opinions to a pretty narrow slice of the spectrum, to criminalizing certain opinions, to uh, getting into needless trouble by taking um, by university, taking stands that really should be the prerogative of its students and faculty. That there isn't any reason that a university should have a foreign policy, or should, uh, uh, and um, and in, in general at the level of discourse where. Uh, just calling someone a racist is considered a, uh, you know, a, 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 a counter argument or, or a refutation. So we uh, kind of formed uh, this, uh, this council to try to push back, to try to offer emotional support to those who are under attack because it can be devastating to be the, the, the target of a cancellation campaign, to also be a constituency that would, uh, while Activists are yelling into an administrator's ear, and, and a lot of the problems that universities have faced have come from the fact that deans and provosts and presidents just want to make trouble go away. And so if someone is yelling at them and making their life miserable, they'll do whatever it takes to get them to shut up. So we figure if we also yell at them, then they'll actually have to think about what's the optimal thing to do rather than just do what makes the, the noise go down. Um, do you feel like it's having, I mean, that this time it's different, that this time it's different. There have been flare-ups in the past, but it seems like the outrage over the response to, you know, I mean, it was really the congressional hearing about the uh, college responses to the attacks by Hamas on Israel. Um, you know, is it different this time? I, I, I think so. There, that, uh, I mean, Harvard itself and uh, is... You know, is in a, 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 a kind of crisis by its own standards, uh, which is to say that donations are down. And so <laughs> it doesn't uh, really need the money, but it wants the money, right? It, yes. Yeah. Uh, and it, um, and uh, applications are down. Uh, it's uh, become a national joke. I have a collection of memes and headlines and bumper stickers, like the bumper sticker, my son didn't get into Harvard. Um, uh, 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 editorial cartoon of a uh, uh, corporate guy saying this guy has a stellar resume, straight A's, top scores, didn't go to Harvard. Um, so the, the the reputation, which is something that which is a, a huge uh, resource that Harvard has drawn on, um, uh, is uh, is threatened. And when it's threatened, a lot of Harvard's comparative advantage. Uh, will also be threatened. Now, Harvard has a lot of money, but it also can, to some extent, coast on its reputation. And it, it can only go down, right? I mean, for the longest time, it was... <laughs> and and, and uh, at least if the past few months are an indication, it is. And uh, you, I mean, you also pointed out in that Boston Globe piece uh, and elsewhere that it wasn't just that. I mean, the, uh, the affirmative action case uh, that Harvard lost... Did, does that play into the sense that, okay, like Harvard been, has been moving in the wrong direction for a long period of time and needs to kind of back up and get back on the highway? Um, yeah, it did. Uh, it, it certainly got uh, Harvard's attention. And the, the fact that it is, it does have an outsized reputation means that it, it has a, a certain cushion 
that it doesn't necessarily, not every department has to compete to be the best in the, in the country because people, students will come, graduate students will come, donors will give. Um, and so there so can you're be saying that like psychology doesn't really have to work very hard at all, right? <laughs> it's like well, it. Uh, I mean, psychology has gone through through waves, and my my former colleague Steve Costlin is here, who made it the I think the best department in the country when he was a chair and working behind the scenes, which is one of the reasons that I decamped MIT for Harvard uh, almost twenty, well, more than twenty years ago. But the actual quality of departments can go up and down, and but Harvard has a certain buffer right. because of its reputation, which is now, uh, now now being threatened. And a lot of the things that we're proposing would actually, uh, we like we meaning the Council on Academic Freedom, would actually take some uh, leave some headaches on the administration itself. Even though their prime uh, driver is to avoid bad bad publicity, keep the uh, the donations going, but a lot of the trouble especially that our former president, Claudine Gay, found herself in, could have been avoided if Harvard did have a more robust uh, academic freedom policy. Uh, among other things... What, if, do you, what do you mean by that? That well, plagiarism would have been allowed under a more well, robust <laughs> academic freedom? I, I, and I, I, I'm joking, but you in, in the op-ed uh, that you had written, you said you didn't think that it was a hanging offense, uh, Gay's appearance in the, uh, and response in the congressional hearing. Uh, that was before the plagiarism stuff yes, came out. That was is, before. is that is that is the plagiarism? Was that a legitimate firing offense, or is that kind of a side issue? Uh, for me, it was a side issue, okay. and, I, and I think yeah. I just won't, won't go there because yeah, sure. it's. Uh, I mean, that was her. She was. Her testimony did not differ from the other two right. uh, elite university and only presidents. Only one is left, right? The and MIT yes, president, Liz actually. McGill, yeah. left mm -hmm. even before, and Sally Kornbluth is still the president of MIT, although also under fire. Um, but I, th I think focusing on Claudine Gay was a bit of a, dis uh, of a distraction because the problems are more, as we say, right. systemic. Yeah. Uh, but among them are the fact that universities feel that they have to, uh, uh, universities and their divisions, that they have to offer moral guidance, some sort of you know, pastoral counseling to a grateful nation, what they ought to feel in response to various tragedies right. and, and outrages. And it inevitably gets them into trouble mm -hmm. because someone will think, they haven't, uh, it was too early, it was too late, it was too strong, it was, it, yeah. it was, only one side was represented, they were too, uh, on the other hand. So if they just could shut up and point to a policy that said, we have to shut up, we don't comment, as the University of Chicago has done mm -hmm. for more than 50 years, it would just get them off the hook. They don't have to comment on Ukraine. So that's the institutional George neutrality. Institutional and, neutrality. And, and Chicago, it does, it sticks by that pretty well. Pretty well. That yeah. is, if a department or a center puts up a statement, then they're under pressure to, to take it down. Mm -hmm. And the reason that it's relevant to academic freedom is that it's just prejudicial to the people working in the university or in, in particular in the departments. If your department chair is posting some opinion on police shootings or, or, or Palestine or uh, Ukraine. With Donald Trump, I'm sure or, that or happens even Donald a lot. Trump. Yeah, yeah I, then... we love Trump. I love Trump. My department loves Trump, right, all the time. <laughs> all the time, yes. But it, it is prejudicial to the faculty and the students yeah. who have to worry, are my, are my professional prospects mm -hmm. at stake if I take a position that differs from the official one on my department yeah. uh, website? Would you, in, in your world of institution and neutrality, would individual faculty be free yeah. to issue oh, yeah. and students and everything? Right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's just that the institution yeah. itself should be, the, should be the arena. It should be the debating right. club. It shouldn't uh, actually be a debater. Right. Um, and uh, that leads into one of the other uh, of the five principles. The next one after institutional neutrality was nonviolence, um, which seems insane, right? That you have to say, you know, the colleges should be mostly nonviolent places. But yeah. what, you know, how, do, how does that fit in? Yeah, it's um, again, I think we'd be actually saving the university from themselves. But the idea that a legitimate form of expression of opinion in a university campus should be forcibly ejecting a dean from his office and occupying the building, uh, you know, that just shouldn't be what a university is about. Now, I think a lot of faculty have a certain nostalgia for when they did it in the, in the 60s to protest Vietnam. And it's like, isn't it cute, the younger generation's doing the same thing? But it really isn't okay uh, for a number of reasons. It, it, it's a commitment to the wrong ideals. The ideal of the university ought to be persuasion, 
the careful formation of arguments, not chanting slogans over bullhorns and f- and getting in other students' so faces. So nonviolence includes shouting down, like drowning out speakers. It's one thing to protest. It's another thing to preclude somebody from speaking. Exactly. That is, there should not be a heckler's veto. Mm-hmm. That is, protest obviously is protected, mm-hmm. and protest could involve holding placards. It could invo- It could include... You know, shouting out "you lie" in the middle of a lecture, but it can't involve uh, forcing speakers off the stage, drowning them out, uh, drawing a banner across the stage so that speakers can't see them. That is restricting other speech as a, uh, an ostensible form of Do expression. Do you feel of like your own. Uh, you know the uh, you know the kind of response that came after the, you know, and most of the stuff was touched up by the October seventh attacks, but. Do you feel like students and faculty kind of at Harvard or elsewhere like kind of understand this isn't simply hypothetical, that, you know, nonviolence is actually a principle that we need to kind of hold to? Uh, surprisingly, we've had to make the case, or some, some of us have, that, um, that, is that it's not okay to invade a classroom and start chanting slogans over bullhorns. Yeah. Um, but we had to make that case, that case and that the university should be consistent in cracking down on it. Again, to protect itself, such as the lawsuit filed by the uh, students against anti-Semitism, who uh, have pointed to uh, episodes in which Jewish students have been uh, intimidated, have been um, uh, blocked, in one case were assaulted. Mm-hmm. And if the university just had a policy that speech is, you know, is fine, it's okay, we encourage it, but physical force is not, and and acted consistently, then they would be kind of off the hook for right. uh, kind of selective uh, enforcement. And in fact, the uh, you know now if they started to in- enforce it against the often quite um, disruptive Palestinian student groups, then the Palestinian students groups could file a lawsuit saying, well, how come they're enforcing it against us and they don't enforce it against other groups? And if it was just clear, this is the policy, this is what we're, we're this is what we recognize as speech, this is what we recognize as force, uh, and be consistent, it would remove a headache from And do you think them. the uh, bookstore should stop selling Harvard-branded bullhorns? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like... Uh, it's well, always amazing, right? Where, it is where do amazing. these bullhorns come? I guess Amazon will deliver anything you know, in a couple <laughs> no hours, right? Well, and also just the, the, the first of the, the point of the five-point plan was just a consistent commitment to uh, academic freedom. Because another reason that Claudine Gay got into such trouble is that when she was given what admittedly was a, a kind of a trap that she walked into – that is, if students called for genocide against Jews, would that be prohibited by Harvard's code of conduct? Um, and she made a pretty hardcore ACLU-style free speech argument, which came across as you know, hollow or worse, because you know, we, we've had uh, a, a lecturer who was kind of driven out of Harvard for saying there are two sexes. Yeah. We've had a... a Professor whose course well, there are only two sexes. <laughs> yeah, only right, two. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There are only two sexes. That there's a uh, another professor whose course was canceled because he wanted to apply to explore how counterinsurgency techniques could be used against gang warfare. Mm-hmm. We had a, a professor in the School of Public Health who, someone doing some offense archaeology, uh, uh, uncovered the fact that he had co-signed an amicus brief for the Obergefell Supreme mm-hmm. Court case uh, against. Uh, a national policy um, uh, allowing gay marriage. Mm-hmm. There were calls for his tenure to be revoked, for his classes to be boycotted. He had to undergo uh, you know, struggle sessions and restorative mm-hmm. justice sessions and basically kind of grovel in front of a mob. Yeah. Uh, so these are, given Harvard's history uh, of, of those cases and others, to all of us and say, well, you know, genocide, it's just a matter of, you know, I, I disagree with what you say, but I defend to the death you write to say it, right. came off as a little bit you know, hollow and hypocritical. Yeah. And if Harvard had had a free speech policy that was reasonably um, uh, enforced before that, then at least she would have had something of a leg to stand on right. in standing on principle. And she was technically correct in the same sense that, in, in the same way that there's no law in the United States that says you can't call for, for, for a Holocaust. Right. 
um, it's protected by hate speech is protected by the First Amendment. Right. But when it's so selectively uh, prosecuted, yeah. then it, it 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 becomes ludicrous and literally becomes a national joke or a national disgrace. Yeah.